Hi there. You're listening to the Everlaid Chronicles, a reading. I'm Garrett Shave, the author. We have finished the primary narrative, and today I will be concluding the novel by reading the epilogue and the author's note. Now, let's get started. The month of July seemed to pass us faster than we had expected. This was because there was much to do at the meadow and much cleaning that needed to happen. Gaia rejoined the Meadow Kingdom, and our small council unanimously elected Prince Oberyn as our new king. He assumed the moniker of Mark, as he had been known before all of this happened. The time for Prince Oberyn was finished, and Mark knew the kingdom needed him again. Their coronation was a grand affair, with confetti and loud cheering. Gripping hands, Mark and Violet came down the hill in triumph. They wore flowing red capes with faux ermine and plastic crowns of gold. I was there in the front lines, cheering and yelling with glee. Slowly but steadily, the kingdom was being rebuilt. New borders were drawn and new aristocracy had been chosen. The entire old establishment had been cleared, except those who had supported us, and many chose not to restart the game. The Commandant, for his skills and bravery, was awarded the title Prince of the Meadow. He was also promoted to heir apparent and given full domain over the military. We hardly spoke of that kiss on the night of the victory, but oftentimes I found him looking at me with the same intense eyes. Sometimes, without even realizing, I would return his gaze. For the rest of us, the Meadow game had changed. The old institution was out and new laws and acts were formed. Our new king brought much of the laws from the past back into action. Mark wanted it to run as smoothly as when Isis had been majesty, and he even invited Jessica to the meadow for some thoughts and advice. They brought along their other friend, Ben, who was happy to see the old playground running in good order. I saw Cuddy Sark a few times that summer, but he was not overly concerned with the governance of the island. He was happy just sailing around and telling his stories. I was happy in my new position as the Duke of Cloverleaf, enjoying novel domain over the yellow slide and tower that was once Cameron's. While Tetsuo had left the game, the now recognized Queen of Rivers stayed on and visited me often in my tower. While she had no dominion or territory, she enjoyed the recognition of her queenly status. Hearing of Nova's espionage and near betrayal, Madison demoted her to the position of court maid. The Elite Four, with the exception of Mantis, retreated and never returned. They took their sad emperor with them, destined to wander the wastes forever. Mantis remained, but he decided to hang up his katana for good and become a regular farmer in Sunset. It had always occurred to me that they could potentially come back for revenge, but Lady Sakura assured me that she had used some of her magic to curse them. Now you're probably wondering what's next for me. Well, much like my cousin Jessica, I felt a strong tie to the island and the meadow. I felt I belonged here now, and it was my duty to remain and govern accordingly. Eventually, I feared my imagination would dissolve and I would leave this place behind, but looking at people like Mark and Jessica gave me hope. They were much older, and they still possessed just as much imagination as Nova or Lurcille, or even the Dragon Emperor. They were unique. They had not let the adult world cripple them, or their childhood dreams, nor of their responsibilities. I secretly hoped Mark would stay on for more than one season, but he might have other plans. I knew that the meadow would be safe in the hands of Commandant Alexei when the time came for Violet and Mark to leave this wondrous place. At least for now, there was peace, and we could rejoice in our victory as Queen Isis had done barely three years prior. We children could be happy with our accomplishments, that we had defeated evil and driven it from our lands. While revolution was rampant, at least during this time there was prosperity and peace. I was most happy here, and I would remain here as long as possible, and I often thought about that kiss as the summer went on. Either way, things were back to what they were once more. Things had finally been restored to their luster, to their former glory, and to the brightness that illuminated the stories Jessica told of this place. I yearned to hear them all, and any time Jessica was free, she regaled them to me over hot cocoa and cookies. Everglade Meadow was my kingdom, a kingdom of glory and triumph, a kingdom of light once again. I will now read the author's note. 
Please forgive me if there is a change in the volume for this episode. I adjusted my microphone settings. I found the tale of the Cloverleaf Lord a little easier to write, considering there was already folklore and myth I could borrow from. Nonetheless, the book gained its own spirit and identity. The second book is a treasure of its own, as it explores different themes and new ideas. Things are very different this time around, despite the same settings. Theo spends a great deal of his days asking questions and figuring out answers while trying to survive in a very totalitarian society. Readers might find comfort that some characters return, either in a small capacity or as full-fledged individuals. Jessica herself takes solace in finding out that her beloved Madison Keystone is now the Duchess of Sunset. While it is later revealed that the Dragon Emperor is none other than the dastardly Hudson Shepherd, who sought revenge on the meadow for his mistakes, it is important to note the lengths the individuals go to preserve their own cult of personality. Hudson saw his flaws and downfalls as the Duke of Sunset, and sought to redeem himself as an all-powerful, omnipotent demigod emperor. If you are unfamiliar, an emperor typically outranks a king. He also pined for revenge against Queen Isis and her legacy. His loyal comrades were all in favor of his authoritarian behavior, as long as they could partake, and his quote-unquote ignorance is bliss policy. Lord Cameron seems to be entirely convinced that problems will simply solve themselves and to not ask questions. This is propaganda fed to him from his cousin, the Elite Four member Fox. Subconsciously, the Dragon Emperor believed that Theo was ignorant of his cousin's reign, but gave him a title anyway, away from all the action. He thoroughly hated Theo for being a walker and wanted to punish him. He had a direct connection with Isis who oversaw his downfall. He also believed that there was some prophecy regarding his demise. Unfortunately for us, he never reveals where he heard the prophecy from. The Dragon Emperor himself is contrary to Queen Venus, who was all about showing off her regal form. The Emperor prefers to be perceived as an untouchable deity. In a way, the Emperor is allowing his appearance to be determined by his attributes, such as untouchable, dangerous, and powerful. The children of the meadow are therefore forced to imagine his appearance, and to the majority of them it is rather scary. Video games and fantasy play a larger role in this novel, as the story has advanced in time. Several characters, most notably Commandant Alexei and the Elite Four, borrow their names and titles from video games. Even the Dragon Emperor utters a famous phrase, Know My Power. This phrase is spoken by Nintendo's Meta Knight. Mark Glass assumes the guise of Oberon from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. The Elite Four, for those who are unaccustomed, are a quartet of Pokemon training masters from Nintendo's famous Pokemon game series. Such a series was widespread when I was a child, and still retains its popularity even today. I took inspiration from the DreamWorks movie Kung Fu Panda when naming them. I always imagined the Dragon Emperor and the Elite Four would have all taken judo or karate together in their free evenings after school to learn the, quote, dragon arts, end quote. While their costumes might have been complex and near impossible to obtain in real life, you have to remember that Theo is telling the story through his eyes and using his imagination. Perhaps he is imagining their costumes to be more outlandish and intricate than they really are. Such is the joy of childhood imagination. It is only natural that children playing a Fantasy Kingdom game would assume the persona of their favorite video game characters, or perhaps other media. Zack Beverly, better known as Commandant Alexei, borrows aspects of Darth Vader's robotic form in his costume, and the name of a villain from Tales of Vesperia. He also invents a fake battle plan and calls it Order 99, a clever nod to Star Wars. Order 66 involved the cull of Jedi across the universe. While Theo might not be the courageous character that his cousin Jessica was, he certainly is curious. He gets himself into trouble a lot, asking too many questions. That's a fact of life, however. Most of us seek to understand things that are confusing especially considering that Theo is aware that the meadow was different just a few seasons ago, and is bothered by the cult of personality established by the new regime. Bouncing off the first novel, 
aspects of family dynamic are continually explored. I tend to create characters that are related to one another as a form of family security. While the twins Kale and Catherine do not make an appearance, they were replaced this time around by the Japanese siblings Sakura and Tetsuo. Lord Cameron is a close cousin of Fox, and Theo himself is a cousin of the former Queen Isis. A great deal of the planning for the revolution takes place while Theo is under house arrest or in prison. During this period, he bonds with Mantis, who is really a tragic, misunderstood figure. I felt it necessary to deviate from showing much of the battle planning, as it was so overly talked about in the first novel. However, Theo begins to doubt there is even a plan until Alexei comes for him on that rainy day at the Ministry prison. We know the meadow is rife with revolt, but the explanation of planning the revolution often becomes stale and redundant. More of the meadow's lore is divulged, with Theo asking storytellers many questions regarding both Venus and the mysterious King Thomas who preceded her. The Dragon Emperor strives to have the past erased, but the oral history of the children prevails, specifically in Gaia where the history seems to be more deep-rooted. At the end of the novel, Mark touches on the forest spirits and being able to interpret messages from the trees. He also talks about elves. In this way, he becomes a very sage person. Many children turn to Mark as their wise oracle, so it only makes sense for him to be able to communicate with the trees. This is a bit of a precursor for the third novel, which will discuss tree messages and elves. I wanted to include this because children naturally believe in spiritual and mystical values found in nature and society. With the Lost Forest being so mystical, it seemed only natural that elves might have existed some time ago. I once again thank you for reading this novel and the previous one. This has been a labor of love and a long time in the making. Stay tuned for the next novel, which will be the final book in the Everglade Chronicles saga. The third book will focus on the past, and that is all I will reveal. That concludes the epilogue and the author's note. Thank you again, hearty listeners, for joining me on this journey into the tale of the Cloverleaf Lord. You can always support me by liking and following me on Facebook and Instagram. All three of my novels are available on Amazon to exclusively order. This autumn, I will be premiering the third and final book in the Everglade Chronicles, Diary of a Departed Queen, on the podcast. Until next time, my friends, take care and enjoy your summer.